when we look at uh, news of the day, you know, we cover a lot of these stories and, and, and we spend a lot of time uh, focusing on, um, again, uh, you know, how we are impacted um, and, and, and the story dealing with uh, police cases and how folks uh, have loss of life. And it, it, it is always, it is always um, uh, shocking to us, uh, shocking to us um, in terms of when we see these cases. And one of the things that happens is that we often talk about the victims, but we don't talk about uh, the impact on the family. We don't talk about uh, what it means to them. We don't talk, we don't talk about uh, how they have to uh, go through life and uh, are, are dealing with uh, these uh, cases. And uh, one of them uh, that uh, got our attention uh, and we want to talk about um, is a documentary is being done about this particular day. And it deals with um, a young man who, uh, who, who lost his life. His name is Kerry Osley, or Owsley, I'm sorry. Uh, he was found dead in the home he shared with his estranged wife, Lisa, on April 7, 2013. Now, his death was ruled a homicide. The first officer on the scene was Lisa Owsley's ex-husband, Dwayne James Sr., and the father to her two adult sons, Dwayne Jr. and Joshua. Though there are those who believe the investigation was botched and Owsley was murdered. Joining us right now, is his sister, Cheryl Jackson, and Andrea Moorhead Allen, uh, Clover Lane media executive producer from Brandon, Florida. Glad to have both of you here. Thank you. Um, first question so, how long was Carrie, how long was Carrie and Lisa married? Um, they were only married uh, for uh, less than three years. Uh, from the moment, to be clear, Carrie Owsley is the only person of color in this story. He was married to a white woman briefly for about two and a half years. Her adult sons hated him from the jump. Uh, they were uh, on social media talking about how much they hated him, threatening to kill him, calling him uh, the N-word. Um, they, from the very beginning, started to harass him. Um, later, she kind of turned against him as well. And so the day Carrie dies, He's actually moving out of the house with his truck backed up to the door. He calls his own son to come and help him move. And when my uh, nephew gets out there, my brother has been shot to death, um, gunshot to the heart. And the cop dad is the first guy on the scene. He's off duty. Uh, my brother dies with his personal gun. Um, his death is then ruled a suicide. The cop dad admit, admits in his own police report that he watched someone burn the chair my brother died in, that he took the bloody rug from under my brother's body and put it in his own car, even though he was off duty and led an investigation that ruled his death a suicide. Wait, 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 I'm sorry, hold up. Mm. So, I'm trying to understand here. So, her ex-husband is first on the scene, but he's not on duty. Not on duty. Called there by one of his sons. Okay, so one of the sons calls the ex-husband, who's a cop. Yeah. So no, no one called the actual cops. No, not until we believe hours later. So, uh, you know, in the end, what happens is um, they won't do an autopsy on his body, even though it's protocol in Indiana. But later, we earn the right because Harvard Justice gets involved. Ron Sullivan from Harvard Justice, you may know him. Trent McCain out of Gary, Indiana. They get involved, and we exhume my brother's body a year later. And there is a forensic expert who was called as a witness on the George Floyd case who says, flat out, I do not believe Kerry Owsley killed himself. Um, Kerry Owsley would have been standing on his head to have shot himself. And again, why are there two bullet holes behind Kerry? So um, this has been a nine-year fight. And uh, as um, Andrea and I have been on the phone discussing, um, your show is the first show that we've been on where we are going to be talking about what happened yesterday. And that is the appellate court in Indiana threw this case out again. 
um, and they are not allowing my brother's only heir to continue a federal civil rights lawsuit that we have been in the process of creating for more than a decade. <clears throat> so, so um, okay. So an autopsy wasn't done on him? No, not at the time of the... Uh, both my so, mother and I... So, so, so who, who ruled the homicide? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Who ruled the suicide? The coroner on the scene. And then when we interviewed him later, when a news team caught up with him, he said, hey, I could tell by looking it was a suicide. So I say, you know, hey... You can't determine, we wouldn't even need autopsies, right? If you can determine by looking at someone uh, that this is a suicide. So there was no- um, Well, no first, okay, okay, so, okay, so as somebody who's covered many stories, if he killed himself, that means there'll be gunpowder on his hands. That's why you do an autopsy. You check the trajectory of the bullet. That's why you do an autopsy. You check blood splatter. To determine, uh, determine all of that. So this corner on the scene looks at it and goes, oh, suicide, we're done, that's it? That's it. That's it. Now, and so, uh, being okay, a journalist... So the ex-husband ex shows up. Okay, ex I'm trying to... The ex-husband shows up. Are there any records as to it was a 911 call ever placed and how much was later was the place... And like, what's the timeline of when the police showed up? Not the ex-cop who's not not the ex-husband cop who's off duty. Yeah, that's what we don't know for sure. But we do know that when he she calls nine one one, his wife, um, she's not concerned at all with saving him. To be clear, um, my brother is gasping for air. She calls, she thinks he's dead, and then you can hear him gasping for air for almost five minutes. Neither she or the 911 operator ever say um, how they might help him. She says every now and then, hey, he's gasping again. The 911 operator says nothing, to which may, that, I believe that tape has been altered. So she talks about getting the dogs out of the blood. She talks about a window screen out, some windows down. She talks about everything except saving him. Mm -hmm. And so she finally calls 911. She thinks he's dead. She tells the, the 911 operator he's dead. And then he gasps so audibly that the uh, 911 operator can hear him. And so she begins to talk about him gasping. And then, because I'm a journalist, I know that she can't, the, the cops will not go inside because she says she can't find the gun for almost five minutes until he dies. So until that gun is secure, police won't go in. But I say, how far can a gun go when you supposedly shot yourself with it? It has right. to be right. If you, shot, if you shot yourself, the gun likely falls right next to wh wherever you are. Uh, I, I, this is so. Um, so Andrea, y'all have been working on this, and so you've been going, following this, and literally, th th there's no one is curious, and no court system is saying, "Hey, this don't sound right." <laughs> you know what, Roland? Your your first reaction was my reaction, and you're right. It don't sound right. It ain't right. The facts and the evidence and what we've been told, they don't match. And, you know, as journalists, you know, we're in this business to hold people accountable. We're in the business to speak truth to power. We're in the business to make sure that we're fair and accurate in our reporting. And when this case first came to me via Cheryl and another, another journalist, I sat there going, how could this happen in America? But yet we do know that justice sometimes is denied for people who look like us. And I told Cheryl that I would join her in this fight. You know, I have a heart for cases like this, being a 30-year seasoned you know, veteran journalist um, back in Indianapolis for over 21 years. You know, these kinds of cases that typically come into our newsrooms, they are um, especially if the victim is white, those cases are adjudicated pretty quickly. They have a, the, the victim, they've got the suspect, and they're arrested, and then they're on the news announcing, hey, we found the suspect, and this person's going to be held accountable. This case here is about as simple as it comes when, it, when we look at the evidence and we look at the truth. And for no one to hear Cheryl, she has been asking, begging, pleading, protesting, for the last almost 10 years, for no one to look at the information, to look at the evidence and say, 
something's not right here. And to do something about it, it's just unconscionable. And here we are with the CNN reporter, Cheryl, former CNN reporter, veteran journalist and educator, teaching journalism to, to students across the nation for the last 15 years. If this can happen to her, it can happen to any of us. And so we have been pleading to somehow get this case in front of Attorney General Merrick Garland. And I can tell you last week, a couple of weeks ago, when we found out that um, they decided to go ahead and file charges against those officers in the Breonna Taylor case, Cheryl and I said, yes, maybe now we can possibly get this case in front of them as well. And for them to look at this case and to have an independent investigation, everything that should have taken place as it relates to this investigation didn't happen. That's a problem. Yeah. And, and you oh. know, Roland, the, the details are egregious. They're not, they're not superficial. You know, I started collecting information like a journalist from the beginning. Um, it's not hard to look at and say there's something wrong. Uh, to be clear, my brother, again, dies with this cop's personal gun. How is that gun on my brother's property? Um, he admits that. He admits in his own police report. He touches the body. He touches the gun. He takes the bloody rug home. He watches someone, he puts in a quotation marks, burn the bloody, burn the chair my brother dies in, and helps lead an investigation that rules as a suicide. And then we exhume the body after a fight. We hire a uh, Dr. Um, uh, well, uh, Warner Spitz, who is world-renowned uh, forensic expert, and when we exhume his body, we find out he is in, one year later in standing water, which means he was the vault was not closed and his body was not preserved correctly. And so, you know, you can exhume a body 20 years later and it's preserved. And so that's what we thought we were getting. Nobody works this hard to cover up a suicide. So when we find out that not only is his body in standing water. They have literally scraped over the wound after death. Both the court uh, ordered pathologist and the one we hired said they have scraped over the wound after death mm -hmm. so that you cannot determine how close the gun was when he killed himself. So again, I say nobody works as hard to cover up a suicide. This, it's a classic case of cover up. And, and, you, and, and uh, uh, go back to, and I know, know my panel has questions, so. Robert, Nolan, Larry, I'm coming to y'all after this uh, answer here. So he, so the so the ex-husband cop admits to disposing of evidence. Yes, in his own police report, he admits that he took oh, the bloody. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. It's Why is he report. doing? Wait, wait, wait. Why is he doing the police report? What, That's what we want to know. He wasn't. He wasn't on duty. That's you're That's right. That's what we want to know. You're right. So, so what did he admit in the police report of disposing? He admits that he took the bloody rug from under my brother's body and put it in his own car. He admits, and he has in quotation marks, he watched someone burn the chair my brother died in the backyard like this is the 1960s South. He admits to touching every piece of evidence in the crime scene. And to be clear, when I find out about this, I'm on a Match.com date in Chicago. I was living in Chicago at the time. And the guy happens to be a Chicago detective. He ends up being the key to me understanding the evidence. He and I are at a coffee shop. We're talking. He goes to the restroom. When I turn my phone over, everyone in my life has called me to tell me my brother is dead. This cop starts telling me, he said, if I did what this cop did on the crime scene, I would be in the Cook County Jail in my uniform. He said he touched every piece of evidence in the crime scene. And when I asked him why he thought he did that, he said, to make sure that you understand this crime scene is contaminated and you'll never find the truth. Um, questions, uh, Robert, I'll start with you. Uh, this is an, an absolutely harrowing tale, and I, I hope we find justice in this case. Uh, has there been any, any effort by the family to hire their own uh, private forensic investigator to uh, compile a report on this case? And what, uh, beyond the local authorities, have you talked to the state-level authorities to investigate or even to the Federal Bureau, Bureau of Investigations? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Dr. Bill Smock, who was called as an expert on the George Floyd case, is out of Louisville. He's the call of a police surgeon. Mm -hmm. He happens to be teaching a gunshot wound and trajectory workshop in Indiana to Indiana State Police. That's how much the system trusts him. Um, he's also been an FBI consultant. He looks at our case. So one of the, the police officers in the um, workshop says, 
have you heard about the Carrie Owsley case? And he said, no, but if they'll send me the autopsy video, I'll take a look at it. And he says, he goes on the news. I mean, never paid by us. He's not hired by us. And he says, this, I believe this crime scene is staged because my brother's chair was turned over. And he said, in life, no gun blows you back like in the movies, especially not a Cal Walter PPK, which is a very small, small gun. So, yeah. So then um, the the um, authorities, after badgering them, they say they'll turn it over to the FBI. And the, the state level FBI agent told me that the sheriff handed him a box and said, this is all that was left when I got here. The gun is lost. The bullet has been lost. The clothes were destroyed. Um, my brother's body was in standing water. The only thing they didn't destroy is the trajectory of the bullet. And that makes Dr. Smock uh, believe that Kerry did not kill himself. Mm -hmm. So the FBI at the federal level rejects to move forward because they said they have no evidence. But the trick bag is, is that the Owsley family didn't destroy the evidence. The police did. So the evidence, they don't have it. So what is our remedy now? Because they destroyed the evidence. This is how a black man gets mm -hmm. murdered. In, in America and people get away with it. It's all this, and if Andrea and I, as journalists, are breaking down the evidence, we're not, you know, the average person is not equipped to do this. And we're breaking down this evidence. And um, Roland, I know you know my uh, former student, Jasmine Miner, who, who works in news, she heard about this case when I was teaching her. And she also has been, you know, looking through the evidence. And so we've been trying to figure out how to get someone on board. Um, even though we have a team of attorneys, Lobie and Lobie, I don't know if you've heard of them out of Chicago, they are the ones who have uh, gotten awards for uh, people who have been um, the John Burge police officer who forced, um, tortured people into um, black men, specifically into confessions in the 80s. Um, they have been our attorneys working on contingency without pay for five or six years. And so attorneys don't do that if they don't believe there's something there. And That's Andrea right. and I got connected by Jasmine and Andrea just said, I want to tell this story. And that's how we end up here. And let me tell you, a big part of the story, not to bury the lead here, is that, you know, Cheryl went through all of the, the pro procedures to try to have this case independently investigated. And in the state of Indiana at the time, the governor was our former vice president, Mike Pence. And just keeping it real here, Cheryl, he could have called for an independent investigation and he did not. So we have a lot of questions. We wanna know why not. If it is as clean as they say it is, then let us have an independent investigation. If these people are as innocent as we keep being, as we've, we've been told they are, then let us open an independent investigation because we don't trust what they have done during this process. It's all been the worst of the worst in terms of procedure. Everything that should have been done was not done and it was not done properly. The behavior from all of the part participants in this case, unethical, unconscionable, against humanity, and that's what we're fighting for. This case must be held. These people must be held accountable for this heinous crime. And we believe that they are all sitting there in Columbus, Indiana, because they are aware that we are now moving forward with trying to get more people to hear about this case so that we can hopefully get an independent investigation by the attorney general's office. And so we believe that they're scared. We believe that they're one or two of these people who are, you know, some of the characters, if you will, in this, in the, in this brazen crime, that they, want to tell the truth, but have been afraid to tell the truth. They know what happened. And we're going to work as diligently as we can, as long as we have to, to find justice for Carrie. And, and to be clear, uh, the, Mike, the Mike Pence connection is not a superficial one. Mike is from my hometown. Mike and I are about the same age. I wrote a diversity column in the only newspaper in that town for 10 years. Mike knows exactly who I am. I was the diversity trainer for the police department, the mayor's office, the first diversity trainer ever in the school system in Columbus, Indiana. I'm not unknown to him. I went to see him five times. Mike Pence would not see me. Mike knows exactly who I am. And so he would not see me. He would not help me. In fact, uh, former Representative Lee Hamilton, who works at Indiana University now, I went to see him. He called the attorney general's office directly when Mike Pence was the governor of Indiana. 
They called me back directly and said they were going to look into it. Within a week, they called me back and said they were not. The only person that can call down the attorney general's office is Mike Pence. Now, Mike Pence is connected to the people that we have involved in this federal civil rights lawsuit. They are people that he is at the county fair with. One of them says that when he gets chosen by Trump, they call him on his personal cell phone. They quote that in the newspaper. So Mike Pence did not miss the story about his hometown when the Indianapolis Star broke a series of stories Call it with my mother's picture holding my brother, uh, my brother's senior picture saying tainted evidence, the headline on a Saturday and Sunday series. And they threw that on the governor's mansion front porch. Mike did not miss that. And we and Andrea has always re already reached out to Mike for an independent interview. She's interviewed him throughout her career there. Mike knows who I am. He knows who I am. And so far, uh, Larry, Larry, our emails. Larry, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Roland. First of all, thank you for you know bringing this important story on the show and, and talking about it in, in detail. I want to go back to the Suns. You know, you talked about they were posting a lot of hate speech. I'm assuming you know Facebook or some other social media platform. And obviously, you, you highlighted how they felt about them and they made it clear. And I, I wonder what they said in their statements. You know, in terms of what happened, were they present? First, and also they were what statements they gave to authorities. So the uh, so both of them have superficial and multiple um, alibis. Uh, the one that I believe is likely to kill my brother. I've been very I've, I've spoken public about it. Um, I believe the younger son is in his late twenties at the time. I believe Josh James likely killed my brother. Uh, my brother was moving out. Josh was moving in again and again. He had a drug problem. His other my my brother. There are numerous calls to police where my brother is fighting with them, physically fighting with them. My brother had enough of it after a couple of years, he was moving out. The younger son uh, was, says he was not on the premises and yet his alibi witnesses, there are two different alibis. Uh, the other son says that um, he's gonna go for a ride on his motorcycle with another, another person. That person says he shows up and says, that, oh, he gets a call from his mom within five minutes saying my stepdad killed himself. When I post that, someone else calls me and says he was out to our house smoking weed and gets the same call and says my stepdad killed himself. So this is all creating alibis on this day. So we don't actually know the timeline. What I can tell you is they have multiple alibis and I have those. Uh, I've collected every single thing that has happened. And I'll tell you this, not one person or official in that town has said Cheryl Jackson is a liar about anything I've said, because all I say is truth and I can prove everything I say. So nobody ever just posts a story that says Cheryl Jackson tells lies because I'm telling the truth. Um, so both of them, yes, uh, one of them says he wasn't there. I believe that's the one that killed him. There's a, there's a fury of phone calls back and forth between he and his mother, and then suddenly no calls, and then 911 is called. So I do believe he killed my brother, and um, he says he wasn't on the scene. The cop dad stays on the scene through the night, witnesses will say, helps clean the scene, sends the wife for bleach. The drywall truck stays out there for a week and repairs the drywall. And Dr. Bill Smock, the, the forensic guy uh, from the George Floyd case, calls our sheriff and says, hey, I believe this crime scene is staged. Let's go in there, take another look where the bullet holes are, whatever. And the uh, sheriff says, I'm not going to invade the privacy of these, this family. Absolutely not. Uh, no, uh, no, are you there? I don't think you can hear. Okay. Oh, uh, hi. No, you, go, what's, your, go, what's your question? Uh, you're on mute. I think you're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. Uh, control room, let me know what's going on. Uh, I can't hear her. Um, do we have her mute or is she on mute? I want to get her question before we go. All right, for some reason, we're not getting Nola's audio. Uh, so uh, let's get that fixed. Uh, y'all are working on a doc. Um, what's the status of that? Um, and is it near completion? Have you fixed it? Where will it air? Any details? Andrew, you want to take that one? 
Yeah, well, you know, we've been working on the three of us, Jasmine, myself, and and Cheryl. You know, we've been in a conference room for the last, oh gosh, five or six months and just kind of pouring over all the information, the evidence. And, you know, our idea is to really speak about, not just about this case, but really race relations and how the justice system sometimes, for the most part, fails African-Americans, especially when it comes to crimes like this. And so we have a comprehensive nine-part documentary that is slated. We have been in touch with some of the biggest powerhouse production companies across this nation. We have been in touch with other networks who know about this case. But yet, no one so far has said definitively, yes, we want to cover this case. We want to be part of this documentary. We want to find justice for Carrie and justice for Carrie Osley's family. And so this is where we are. We're trying to appeal to the masses. We're trying to appeal to the nation for them to hear the facts of this case and to help us push it forward. So we are still in the infancy stages, but we are prayerful that with, thankfully, with your help, Roland, and, um, and, and everyone who is watching, that they will look at this and say, you know what, we as a people need to do something about this. This has to stop, because if we don't hold people accountable, it will happen again. And I'm sure that we are not the only story where there are people out there who are looking for justice, people who look like us, who have not been able to have their stories be told, whose voices haven't mattered. And we want to be the conduit to let them know that, hey, if we can do it, you can do it. We have to press people to do the right thing and to not back down. So as it relates to the documentary, we are just waiting for that phone call to come through. But in the meantime, we are still going to talk about this case. We are going to be on social media. We are bringing people to join us and to be in protest with us back in Columbus, Indiana. And we're also going to hopefully have people begin to sign a, um, a, a sheet to say, you know what, Merrick Garland, please open this case back up and have an independent investigation. So the ball is rolling and we want everybody to join us and to help push us forward so that we can find justice for this family. And I say, and Andrea, I, can I just say one other thing? Um, Ron Sullivan from the Justice, the Harvard Justice Institute, he's formerly of the Justice Institute, said to me, this may not be the most egregious civil rights case in America, but it may be the one where we have the most evidence. Mm -hmm. We have investigative files that prove what we're saying. And in America, if you can have 100 pages of evidence, and Andrea and I, I've been on TV all over this nation, and we still do not have justice nine years later. Today, I want to say that today, the appellate court in Illinois threw this case out without even hearing my attorneys who've been preparing for it for years. So I heard nothing, no evidence, and just made a blanket decision to say no. Got it. Cheryl and Andrea, uh, we appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, certainly let us know what, what happens and what is moving forward. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. All right, folks, back to our whole Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing. Creating. Making moves. The move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Folks, Black Star Network is this. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?